Yes. Um, first of all, uh, let me say thank you to Trias for uh, inviting me and uh, wanting to set up an exchange between civil society organizations. Uh, the Nexus Fund, Washington, D.C. permitted us to have an exchange, um, to have uh, America's you know, top human rights think tanks to come to Canada and learn about what we're doing there. In, in our society, our democracy, um, and likewise, I'm very pleased to be here to learn from Argentina, to learn from the lessons of what uh, different NGOs, civil society actors, universities, and civil society means, means a very wide group of people, institutions. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. I also want to say thank you to Academy. This is an amazing institution. Um, I'm involved with the Canadian International Council, a think tank similar in Canada, and it's, it's a, always a, a pleasure to be part of the think tank world because think tanks are part of civil society and they uh, play an important role of uh, providing uh, a forum to discuss these ideas with practitioners, experts, academics. Um, basically, I didn't prepare a speech because I find speeches, when you prepare them, they can be quite boring. It's sometimes better to speak from the heart uh, and speak uh, from one's instincts and personal experience. Um, I think when we're talking about um, preventing mass atrocity crimes, um, I think that everyone here has to realize that civil society plays the most important role. Because many places where we have uh, mass atrocities, genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, ethnic cleansing, um, and the other uh, crimes encompassed under the response to project, is that there very often is not a strong civil society. Uh, there isn't usually a free media. So we live in countries that we have uh, this ability to interact with uh, politicians, to interact with government, uh, to interact with the media, to actually inform the wider public, uh, we can't take that for granted. Um, uh, we have a responsibility to ensure our governments uphold the, the laws of the Genocide Convention that they signed and are supposed to implement and act upon as signs of, of atrocities. We also uh, have a moral responsibility uh, to remind our governments, particularly the, the executive branch of government, to uphold the responsibility. So when we see early signs of atrocities that are about to happen, albeit hate speech, um, it's always important that we have to re recognize that mass atrocities don't begin with action, they begin with words. They begin with actually demonizing another group. They begin with starting the process of, and we saw this in Rwanda, and my senior, um, uh, my, my colleague, uh, uh, Romeo Dallaire, who was head of the Human Peacekeeping uh, Mission in Rwanda in 1994, saw this, uh, Right that we are. There were radio, uh, radio broadcasts that were demonizing the minority, demonizing, making them subhuman, and, and prepping the minds of society to kill them. Uh, so civil society has a responsibility to stand up and to say no, uh, and to actually provide concrete policy advice, uh, concrete policy recommendations, so that we can make never again a reality. Um, I think you know it's very interesting here being as a Canadian because my country um, has uh, this is considered a middle power, um, similar to Argentina. Uh, it doesn't have a population of a billion people or 300 million. Uh, it's not the most powerful country, but small middle power countries can make a difference. And I just highlight that my country uh, had a major role in inventing uh, UN peacekeeping. Our former prime minister, uh, who was the former minister at the time, Lester Pearson, won the Nobel Peace Prize for introducing uh, peacekeeping. That had a lot of uh, positive aspects of protecting civilians and ensuring peace. And then again, my country um, government took a major lead uh, in introducing the Responsive Project. So Lloyd Axworth, the former foreign minister of Canada, really believed in um, the term of human security that governments should make change their foreign policy to make the individual, uh, the protection of individual citizens, the cornerstone of foreign policy. So those are, are two aspects of my country I'm very proud of. I did serve in my, in my government, uh, but I'm very, very proud that they, they pushed that. Um, so what does my institution do? Well, first of all, um, as part of civil society, I'm based at a university, and I think there's one term I'm going to, to bring forward. It's, it's, I'm going to quote Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela said, uh, the most powerful tool you can use to change the world education. And I think uh, I think that's one of the most important roles that civil society can do. It's to educate, it's to teach policymakers, to interact with parliamentarians, um, to actually give them the knowledge uh, to help identify um, when atrocities are about to take place, um, and to also 
try to bring in experts to formulate new ideas of how to actually stop these atrocities. Because the sad reality is that governments have signed the Genocide Convention, we've endorsed RGB, but we've only just begun to build the national capacity to act. Um, and I say national capacity because um, for any of you who are uh, familiar with the response to protect, when uh, RGB was introduced in 2001, Unfortunately, just after the 9-11 attack, so it didn't get uh, as much attention uh, in September or October 2011. But there's an interesting chapter of, of, um, of the RGP report that was produced by the uh, International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. And it basically said, uh, in chapter 8, it says, building political will. And it, it said, before you mobilize international political will, you must first mobilize domestic political will. So the idea behind that is that the United Nations, which I worked for as a diplomat. That's great things, it has some bad sides to it. But the United Nations is only as strong as its member states will allow it to be. But it's basically to say is that you know in, individual governments have responsibility to support the United Nations to do a lot of this work, but, but we haven't. And my colleague Romeo Valer complained that when he was left uh, to watch a genocide unfold in Rwanda that um, claimed the lives of 10,000 people a day for three months claimed almost a million lives. He doesn't blame the United Nations for the failure. He blames individual governments that blocked action, that blocked the United Security Council. And he feels that the only way to actually move the ball forward to make progress on RGP or genocide preventions is to start building capacity and knowledge within the nation state. Um, so that's kind of what my institution really works upon. Uh, we also believe that civil society has an important role in enabling leadership. What does that mean? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, my institute in 2008 approached a group of Canadian parliamentarians, and uh, we created something called the Canadian All-Party Parliamentary Group for the Prevention of Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity. So there's a group now in the Canadian Parliament uh, that uh, is comprised of about 50 members of Parliament from all political parties, and another 40 senators. And we uh, were the institutional partner of that group. We support the group by having a graduate student that we pay as an intern that helps organize briefings in the Canadian Parliament. It brings experts from within Canada and outside Canada to meet the parliamentarians, to give them specialized briefings on what the United States government is doing, is atrocity prevention uh, infrastructure, to talk about uh, certain conflicts like Boko Haram in Nigeria, which is a larger pressing issue, looking at what can be done to prevent ISIS. That's captured our attention up in Canada and the United States. I'm sure it's captured the attention of people in Argentina as well. Um, being very uh, adamant in social media to, to advertise their atrocities rather than to hide them as we've seen in the past. So, so we work with parliamentarians to really try to actually build that knowledge, uh, build across party lines, to start to actually um, you know, showcase what can be done. Uh, so that's one example. Um, on the education front, um, as I told you, uh, quote from Mandela, we also realized that there are so many people working in the NGO, civil society, world, and government, but they don't really understand the early warning signs of genocide and atrocities. So um, we decided two years ago to create the world's first um, professional training program for the prevention of mass atrocities. It's now an annual exercise. It's taking place the last two years in Montreal. Um, we're going to have a problem with it this year in Ottawa, but we've, we've had great success bringing over 40 professionals from across the world. We've had people from the US government, from the FBI, we've had people from the Turkish government, different diplomats from, from, from also African countries. We have people from major NGOs like Doctors from the Borders. Um, we've, we've created a forum for people to come share experiences and build a network of people who care. And this is called, uh, among some people, um, a community of commitment to enforce our community. So those are other aspects that, that civil society in Canada is really working on. Um, and I think, uh, I think that, that those, those, those examples can also be uh, used in Argentina's case, or in South America, to provide training. I know my colleague here uh, is doing an amazing role with the Auschwitz Institute to actually train similar training around the world. Um, ours is one that anyone from any professionals can sign up for. So if there's anyone here that wants to come to Canada, not in the winter, but in the summer, I'd love to have you come and join us. It'd be great. Um, another aspect that, that my personal interest is starting to see how um, I've talked to you about hate speech, dangerous speech, where people use radio, newspapers. Um, cartoons to incite hatred, to uh, instill uh, a sense of your identity is under threat by another minority in your society. But what we've seen the last couple of years, we've started to see a major transfer of online hate. 
to say is that while it happened in radio and TV in the past, it's now taking place online. So Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, ISIS have shown us that they're masters of this. Um, but yet nobody is really working to stop the spread of, of genocidal ideologies online. Um, and this also reflects to my case where I see now uh, there's a case in Canada that we're waking up to that there's over 130 Canadians who have gone over to Iraq and Syria to join ISIS, to commit atrocities. So we now have a responsibility to prevent these people from joining these groups. Um, and, and this idea of the responsible protect that I have a paper coming out of the Canadian Defense and Foreign Affairs Institute also entails national responsibilities to stop these groups from spreading hate online in Canada, but also internationally. So with that in mind, we've created something um, at my institute called the Digital Mass Atrocity Prevention Lab. It's the first lab of its kind in Canada um, that is going to study uh, how to stop and counter people online and use social media to spread hatred. Um, there's a great example uh, in the last elections in Kenya. Um, after the, the violence that took place in Kenya after the elections in 2007, there were a lot of fears that people would use Facebook to promote hatred. So the Kenyan government set up um, a group, a task force within the, the Kenyan government to actually um, take content down from Facebook uh, to stop the spread of these hateful messages, particularly from people that were place to influence the wider public. Uh, so these are some of the aspects that we want to look at. We also want to look at, um, and are starting to look at, um, something called the power of witness. Um, uh, the power of witness was first developed by uh, Sarah Sewell of, uh, at Harvard University. She's now the undersecretary state um, for human rights and democracy. Uh, and basically what the power witness basically argues that if you can capture images in real time uh, of people committing atrocities, um, you can sometimes have the, the impact of changing a government's behavior or stop them and put it out of the public sphere, stop governments from doing what they're doing to the people. Or at the very least it can be used for eventual prosecution. To take uh, these cases and you can't stop it, you can actually eventually prosecute. So these are some of the new ways that we're looking at how you can use uh, drones or satellite imagery to capture uh, power of witness, to capture images. Uh, we've had up in Montreal, we've had uh, an amazing group in Washington called the Enough Project, and, and they work with George Clooney, the actor, believe it or not, to set up something called the Satellite Sentinel Project, where they, they basically, uh, you know, 20 years ago, only four or five countries had satellites that can spy in and, and, and actually capture images of, of the size of a grapefruit. In any country. Now you have NGO civil society. They're able to hire uh, commercial satellites from a, a firm in Colorado called, um, it's not going to mind now, but there is a company that they're able to hire. And they put the satellite over the South, uh, South Sudan Sudanese border to capture images of uh, Sudanese uh, military troops crossing the border to go down and actually, they can actually analyze <coughs> the tire tracks to tell if it's coming from a military vehicle and whether it's in stock of, uh, in stock belong to the Sudanese government. Uh, we've had other uh, groups, there's an amazing uh, group in Ottawa that we partner with, and I think you might have met with them when you were in Ottawa, called the SecDev group. Um, and they actually um, are able, through the software they develop, to go through uh, thousands and thousands of Facebook pages. So it sounds a little bit kind of CIA, but, uh, but to capture, go through hundreds of thousands of, of social media pages to find evidence of, um, of atrocities taking place in Syria. And within 20, 30 minutes, they're able to geolocate where it's taking place. And they're able to analyze if the weapons that these people have are, are from the military or not. So it's, it's a way to actually capture a better picture of what's happening on the ground and use this information um, to actually uh, you know, push our political leaders to actually take action or to share with the United Nations and other actors to actually do something. So I think these are all you know, very, very positive experiences. And I think if you look at since the Responsive Chapter was introduced in 2001, then it was endorsed by all countries at the United Nations in 2005, including Canada and Argentina. Um, you see that there's actually a, a serious, serious growth of NGOs, of civil society that's working on the of mass atrocities. Um, everyone says that during the Rwandan genocide, um, there's a famous case of, a, of an American um, senator from Colorado who said she had no calls from anyone saying you must take action to save people, but she had about 100 phone calls from environmental groups and animal protection groups saying you must take action to save endangered gorillas. And to say that back then in 1994, there were almost no human rights civil society groups that were very permanent, 
that had the structure to actually urge action. And now in 2014, we have the International Coalition for our, the Response to Protect, a New York based network that my institute's part of, the University is part of, I believe, uh, the Gosh Institute is. And there's now over 120 NGOs, and this is growing by 10 or 20 a year, but who's focusing on this? Um, so I think it's very positive. I think it's, it's great to see that the um, community commitment is starting to grow, um, starting to build permanent roots uh, and develop relationships across society. Um, and I basically am probably not in my 15 minutes, but I'd like to see some time to take questions after the discussion. So I'm going to maybe say thank you for listening and pass on to the next.